Hi, and welcome back to C-Tech Cable Channel 8. We're in the spotlight this evening with Joseph Diogaudio. He's a CPA and a former member of con Congress. As you well know that we've been interviewing all the politicians that are running for the primary on September 13th. So uh, we have Joe's here now, and we're going to find out what Joe is all about. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. Nice to be here. Joe, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you're a CPA. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, where you came from and uh, why you're running for Congress. Well, my background is rather simple, and uh, you know, people say about the great opportunity society that America is. I guess my family is one of the many millions of success stories where my parents came here as immigrants uh, from Italy. And I was born and raised uh, in the Bronx. Uh, part? In those part days, it was the East Bronx. Now it's called the South Bronx, anything what south of that? Fordham Road. Uh, Tremont Avenue, Katona, sure, Dad had a, a grocery store there. Grew up in and moved to Fordham Road. Terrific. So welcome to the club. There's a lot of people up here for the Bronx. I understand. I went to St. Martin of Tours Grammar School. Uh -huh. I was baptized uh, in Our Lady of Mont Carmel on 187th Street. Beat you all the time in football, Mont Carmel. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I continued to, by the way, I went to Fordham Prep. Um, yeah. Thank God, Dad and went Mom. Went to Fordham University. Uh, and I went to Fordham University, so too, so eight <laughs> years there on Rose Hill. Yeah. We moved to Westchester when I was 16, 1957, and I continued to commute to my senior year uh, in Fordham Prep and then went to Fordham University. So you might say that uh, I've got a, a good base of experience from both the city and both Westchester County. Uh, I'm proud of America that my dad, who had very little education, was able to come here in 1929 with a vision for his family, for himself, and looking for economic opportunity, he found it because he knew that hard work and producing was the answer. Uh, many people say to me, Joe, why are you a conservative Republican? I'm conservative because I see the damage that too much government does. I believe in helping, <laughs> yeah, I believe in helping people help themselves. I believe in what the great Jewish philosopher Maimonides said, to paraphrase him, he said the highest level of giving, the eighth level of charitable giving, is to give a man a f uh, is to not give a man a fish, teach him how to fish, make him your partner, not your ward or your slave. And um, so, as a conservative, I believe in getting government out of the way of people. I believe in leaving money in the people's pockets, your pockets, not bringing it to Washington if it can be avoided as taxes, because there. It's usually spent on, on things that waste. Are, are not advertised. Right. You know, you talk about truth in advertising. We'll get into that a little right. later, but there's a lot uh, of waste. Yeah. And, and it's not, um, and it builds a bureaucracy that tends to be like a shadow government. I've seen this now as a businessman. Uh, I spent 22 years in the accounting firm Arthur Anderson. Uh, it was not H&R Block, nothing wrong with H&R Block, but I was trained very well in the world's largest accounting firm at that time uh, to see things that no other member of Congress saw and could have seen because I was the only practicing certified public accountant ever elected to Congress in 218 years. Is that correct? Is you're the sitting, only CPA? Yes. Is that still, uh, still today? Yes, that's still today. There were five attorneys who passed the CPA exam, but nobody ever went to Congress as a practicing certified CPA, public, public accountant. accountant. Uh, and they by don't the way, like you. Right, they let me, didn't like you. <laughs> well, you can be sure that uh, they didn't want to hear my speeches about uh, their fiscal insanity. Uh -huh. and, and that's why I wrote the book, Unaccountable Congress. When I left, I see you've got a copy yes, in but, your hand. Uh, the book that he's referring to, the book that he's referring to, uh, Joe, you were a member of Congress from 1985 to 1988. I'd like to touch on that, too. Uh, but the book years. here is written by Joe Diaguardi. Joe Diaguardi, CPA, and it's the Unaccountable Congress. And... Uh, I've read some of the headlines about it, but I'm interested in reading it in, in full. But on the front, there's a picture of a gold credit card. Now I'm going to ask Joe, what is the purpose of the gold <laughs> credit card? And when you find out, you're going to flip out. So, Joe, give us the story well, on that. You know, it's a very complicated subject when you talk about trillions and billions. Uh, you could tend to put people to sleep. You know, most people, myself included, cannot count that high. That's true. And, and that's how much government uh, owes out. And it's incredible. And when you get into the budget process and you're trying to explain to people what's off the books, what's on the books, what the national debt really is, what the deficit really is, uh, if I didn't come up with visual images and verbal images, and you'll see those in the book, uh, people wouldn't get the message. So I felt that the cover should have the best 
visual image that I could find, and I've got it right here. It's a congressional voting card. I don't now, know if the camera Joe can Joe has here. this card because he was a member of Congress for four years, and that's, that's why right. he has this card. It doesn't work anymore as a voting card, but it's a good identification card when I go to Washington because a former member has access to the House floor for the rest of his or her life. Um, frankly, lobbyists use it, but I'm not a lobbyist, and I refuse to be a lobbyist. Tell otherwise, us, run again. Tell us when you were in Congress what you did with that card. Well, I waved it around a lot. That's why my <laughs> members, uh, the fellow members, didn't like it. If you see the book uh, for a minute there, Kevin, the mm -hmm. reason why I wanted to paint it gold was for effect, so you'd remember your gold card or a gold card. Mm -hmm. And I say in the book, uh, credit line unlimited, expiration date never, never. built to future to generations. generations. And in effect, this has become the most expensive credit card in the world. Uh, I'd like to say that when I left Congress in 1989, I left behind 276 attorneys. Imagine a place with 276 lawyers and no accountants. That's Congress. <laughs> Everybody's spending, nobody's counting. But I did take something with me. I took this card and I wave it around because I want people to realize that every time there's a vote and they vote in Congress with a computer at the end of a row of seats, when you put this card in, you have 15 minutes to cast your vote um, during a, a, a regular vote. There's sometimes a five minute vote and you press yes, a green light goes by your name, no, a red light goes by your name, or if you're present, it's just an orange light. So one time I was running to cast some votes and I said to myself as I pulled this out, it was right next to my uh, Visa card and, 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 and MasterCard, I said, it looks like a credit card. My God, it is a credit okay. card. Because 60% of the votes in Congress are on money, are on appropriations, are on budget resolutions. And when this card is put in, there's not enough money to cover, cover. those votes. That's why we have deficits. That's why we sell so bonds. Good. There's $30 billion of bonds being sold every month to cover the old debt that's expiring. They roll it over. And pay off and the to interest. Pay off, and to pay off the, the interest. interest. And for the new deficit, that's, that's new debt that's required. Mm -hmm. So really, we're charging the next generation with this card. And I, I came up with a little... Uh, Can I just 90... see that card one second? Sure. Just, I just want to <laughs> imagine out there if we all had a credit card like this. Can you imagine if we all went to the stores and we all did our shopping locally here in the area and we had this credit card and it had no line of credit on it? I mean, that No limit. No <laughs> limit. And that you could just constantly charge and charge and charge. And then when the bill came in, you just put an appropriation bill on it and it says, okay, let's increase the debt, and they just pay it off. And it would be a great way, boy. We live real good, and I guess that's the way the members of Congress well, have a run in the country. It's interesting. You don't even need an appropriations bill when you go over. Appropriations means you're really going to um, get the cash, or in effect, you're going to sell bonds to get the cash. Yeah. You're right. So an appropriations right. bill can force the Treasury to sell bonds right. to get the cash to write the checks yeah. when they run out, and that's why we're running up this national debt. Now, if that's not bad enough, what my book tells you is that's what's on the books. There are things that we're doing today off the books where they don't make it part of the deficit. They disguise it, uh, like the Resolution Trust exactly. Corporation, okay. um, and you'll see this uh, on page 18 of the book, where they, in 1989, uh, came up with a uh, $50 billion debt in order, or, or bonds in order to fund the Resolution Trust Corporation and that was off the books in order to lend it to an on-book agency called FISLIC. That was the, the bailout, the, 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 bailout. the Federal mm -hmm. Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation. And uh, yet, while we spent the money, and it's in the national debt, it never became part of the deficit, so the people didn't know it. So, and there are other things where we're committing, like Social Security. There's at least a $6 trillion, as, as actuaries and accountants know it, obligation under Social Security. Well, that's not in the national debt. All they've put in the national yeah. debt is the bonds we've issued. Now, I'm glad you brought up the Social Security because it is, we have a lot of senior citizens here. And, and, and seeing that you, you're in Congress, you can verify this for me. Tell me if I'm wrong. Also with Social Security, you read in the papers, you read in the U.S. News and World Report, Time Magazine, New York Times, that the Social Security is good, it has a surplus to the year 2005 or 2015. But there's really no surplus in there. Isn't that money there just an IOU of the federal government and it's, and it's in the IOUs of the government that there's real no money set aside for Social Security that has a bank account on it that has all these billions of dollars. If you open up that bank book, so to speak, you would find an IOU in there from the federal government. The federal government that owns about $4.5 trillion, dollars, right? Right. So there's well, real no money there. There's no real no surplus. It's already been spent. It's really not a trust account. Right. And yet 
All the politicians like to talk about it being a trust, trust account. account. Uh, and that's chapter five of the book. Look. I named it Congressional Child Abuse. Please. Send the kids the bill <laughs> because the kids are going to have to find that money in the future. future. Right. We're kind of forcing them to raise taxes on themselves in order to replace that Social Security money because what's happened, uh, Kevin, is that even the money we raised through the Social Security mm -hmm. tax, and if you remember, Carter put the Social Security rate and the base on automatic pilot mm -hmm. since 1979. So for 10 years, you did have a surplus, but they took the cash out yeah, and right. they reduced yeah. the deficit in other programs. programs. And they replaced it with a Treasury bill yeah, which or is a Treasury IOU. note, an IOU. Yeah. So not only do you not have the almost $1 trillion that was collected in 10 years that was a surplus, that cash is not there. The other $5 trillion that we owe is certainly not there. Yeah. It's not even recorded on the books as a liability so because it's not in the national debt. Now, anybody in the private sector, if this were a publicly traded corporation, under the Securities and Exchange Commission rules, which require generally accepted accounting principles, and I don't call for exactly that on the government, the government is a different kind of entity, but you certainly should have full disclosure, you certainly, certainly should record all of your liabilities, but an officer of a publicly traded corporation using the accounting system that the federal government uses would be indicted and probably convicted and put in jail. And yet we have the government using that system. Same, and that's the point I make in the book. So what I want to do is uh, ask you a couple of questions concerning your beliefs, uh, what you're going to be doing when you should uh, be fortunate enough to win not only the primary but the election, uh, what you can do to help us as, an, as the next CPA member of Congress. Uh, as the one and only. As the one and only, <laughs> going back and being the one and only. Right. As you know, we have a lot of problems here. We just now passed the crime bill. Mm -hmm. uh, give us your, I want to go over a couple of things with you. We don't have much time. We, we, we only have a half hour show and we probably did about half of it already, but let's, let's jump on crime and healthcare. But let's well, let me give you the bottom line of what I believe and then we'll get into right. those, those two issues as well. Uh, I'm a conservative Republican and I'm proud of it. I spent four years in Congress in difficult elections. Don't forget, I had to send Bella Rabzuk back to Greenwich Village. That was my race <laughs> in 1986. Uh, it's it's now a luxury to be running in a Republican yeah, district. Crazy. I've always run in, in Democrat districts. But I'm in this race because, number one, my good friend Hanfish is retiring. I did not announce against him as others did. But I believe I can begin to fill his shoes because I've had experience. I at least spent four years in Congress. He spent yeah, 26, 26, so I'm the yeah. only one that can say that I've got any claim on seniority yeah. for committee assignments, things like that, and this district needs somebody who knows the territory. Also, I represented 200,000 people in this district, in Mount Pleasant, Ossining, Mount Kisco, Chappaqua, Armonk, North White Plains, so I've got yeah. a base, and there are people who know me and, and, and wanted me to run because they know the kind of representation that I uh, performed uh, when I was in Congress. The other thing is, this is a great year for Republicans to run. It wasn't like 1992 mm -hmm. with Bush failing in the polls. Right. Now you have Cuomo and Clinton. So for those three good reasons, plus the fact that I've always felt that my place was in public service, I thought this would be a good race for me to be in. I guess the best reason of all, though, Kevin, is that I believe what I believe in is what the people of the 19th Congressional District believe in. Uh, number one, taxes. I have never, ever thought of raising taxes. As a matter of fact, even in 1992, I called for a reduction in the capital gains tax to 10% to loosen up all this locked-in Which is still capital. good today, which is a, vile, a valid statement today. Oh, yes, and I, you can be sure the first thing right, I do right. when I go to Congress is to try to roll back Clinton's tax increases right. and to reduce the capital gains tax from where it is today. It's, it's over 30% to, right. um, you know, between the state and the federal, oh, yeah. uh, to 10%. And I think that's important because we want to see people sell things, a little money comes to the Treasury, they're not getting it right now right. anyway, and that money then gets reinvested or saved. And when it gets saved, the old multiplier effect, sure, you know, San Luis in 101, that means it's there to be lent to business. Uh, as the long 19th, as the federal government doesn't take it and spend it. That's right. Okay. Well, that's why right. I want only 10% right. to go, not 30% right. to right. go. Uh, the thing that you have to know is that the 19th Congressional District is among the most overtaxed districts in the United States of America. When you consider the combination of school taxes, real mm -hmm. estate taxes, the property taxes, uh, sales taxes, county taxes, uh, if you're in a city that taxes like Yonkers, but that's just outside Inside. the district, there are some cities here, and then certainly Cuomo and Clinton, the state and the federal government, you're talking mm -hmm. about a tremendous burden, and the people are fed up. 
and they're not seeing the money spent the right way anyway. So I would assure all of the people listening to your show that I would never, ever, ever consider a tax increase and will try my best to reduce taxes because I believe the money in your pockets is where it belongs, number one, and you know better what to do with your money than the federal government. The federal government will create a bigger bureaucracy, will keep you online with more forms to fill out. They will stifle business. They're certainly going to, you know, hurt your own family plan if they take too much of your money. And by the way, a definition of the bureaucracy, and I witnessed it firsthand, my definition, the bureaucracy is the process of turning energy into solid waste. That's what nice, I witnessed. Nice, nice, nice <laughs> so, example. Right. Nice so example. besides taxes, the next thing is certainly crime. Sure. Uh, we have a problem here because we're close to New York City. And with the amount of drug use and drug traffic, we have problems in our neighborhoods. There are burglaries. People in the 19th Congressional District have to lock their doors not once, but two and three times. And um, It's a sad way to live. It's a sad way to live. And in New York State, on the Mario Cuomo, we've had uh, an environment here where we're protecting the criminals and not the citizens. Uh, certainly, I would vote for a death penalty. I voted for one in the federal government for drug kingpins who commit murder. And I believe it will be a useful deterrent. Uh, I think that we've got to put more money into law enforcement. I would have voted against the crime bill that you mentioned because it had over $8 billion in social spending. Why do we need, in a $30 billion bill, that kind of money being spent on social spending? Almost 30%. Yeah, it, it's not right. If you want to spend it on welfare, call it welfare. welfare. If you want to spend it on social welfare, okay. call it social, social welfare. welfare. If you want to spend it on something else, tell the public the, the truth. truth. That's why I set up a foundation once I left Congress called Truth in Government. We have truth in lending, truth in advertising imposed on us right mm -hmm. by government That's state right. and local why don't we impose truth in government on them if you want to spend something tell us what it's for mm. you know right. label it the right way and let yes, the taxpayers sir. know yes, so i would have voted against that bill because not enough money went into the law enforcement side the it, police offices it wasn't the 30 billion dollars that you that you object to it's the it's the 30 percent that Where goes to social right, exactly absolutely exactly right. if i saw the rest of that money being spent directly to protect the citizens put it on the streets, uh, you know, create coalitions like I did when I was a congressman, be creative. You know, it's not just money that you got to talk about. Money's important, but you need to be creative. You need to find leverage. And when I was a congressman, I created a partnership between the Drug Enforcement Agency, the DEA, and the local police forces. We deputized 43 local policemen in each of the townships in the old 20th Congressional District, including Westchester, that's now part of this district. Uh, and we deputized them as marshals, and we created a fund so that if there was any properties confiscated, that money would not be just taken by the federal government, it would be shared with the local police departments, so there was kind of an incentive for them to work together. That is still working very well today in Mount Vernon and Yonkers and New Rochelle, where you have a lot of drug usage right near the border of New York City. I mean, let's face it, that's where it spills over right now, because uh, the laws in New York City are not being enfor enforced mm -hmm. the way they should. So crime is a big issue, and I want to see a lot more tough uh, provisions. For instance, um, mandatory sentencing. If there is a repeat violent criminal, I think that we need mandatory sentencing. If there is someone that is using drugs while they're in jail, and we hear these stories all the time, and it was proven to mm -hmm. me when I was in Congress, I introduced bills, uh, I'll reintroduce these bills, that you cannot be let out of jail unless you're tested. Because if you're still taking drugs while you're in jail, it sounds ridiculous, what are you gonna but do there is usage in jail. What are you going to do when you get out of jail? Yeah, That's right. where most of the crime comes from. Right. Same thing with probation. Right. If you're out of jail already and you're just about to be let off probation, we should be entitled to take a drug test to know that. So I would really get down to some common sense, hard-hitting things, which I think are fair to the constituents uh, in, and the taxpayers of America, certainly in the 19th Congressional District. The issue of spending is related to the issue of taxes. Uh, you can be sure that I'd be for a balanced budget amendment, a line item veto, and yes, even term limitations. A 12-year term is enough because we don't see enough of a turnover. If someone says, well, what happens when you have someone who's so great that you don't want to lose them after 12 years? Well, do what Joe Diaguardi did. Take a sabbatical for two or four years, go around and teach, write a book, and if you think you're that good, 
make your case okay, again, so run in another election, wrong. you'll be reelected for another 12 years. Well, so another that, good thing about term limitations is something that you, you did on before. What happens in a lot of these bills is that you get people in there so long, they become chairman of certain yes. committees, and they insist on these bills having pork in them, mainly for their districts. Right. And if you don't vote for them, you're not going to get your piece of the right. pork, and that's what creates a lot of a lot of bad decisions in the government. So right. a 12-year uh, or a term limitation would eliminate that, right? Right, absolutely. absolutely. So. Let me just get into two other issues right. because I think uh, uh, related to health care is the issue of, of life, uh, why I'm against mm. abortion, certainly as a means of artificial birth control, and that's what's happening with this Freedom of uh, Choice Act. Uh, it's incredible to me that under the Freedom of Choice Act, you could theoretically have an abortion in the ninth month for sex selection. This is not right. It's not human. Uh, I think that this is an area where we have to use a lot of compassion. Uh, the real issue, Kevin, is why do we have so many unwanted pregnancies in America? I think that's the issue. Abortion is a symptom of that problem. Now, when someone gets pregnant and they don't want the pregnancy, we have to be as compassionate as possible. We have to provide options. We can't say that we can't, you, you can't have an abortion without having options that someone can choose from. Uh, I very much like what the Respect for Life Committee is doing in the Catholic Church and also their birthright program where they find families to adopt children so that there is a real choice. And you might say, well, is there a market for this? Well, look at the hundreds of thousands of couples that are going to Eastern Europe, Romania, Columbia, picking up babies with, Columbia, 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 with, with AIDS, mm -hmm. all kinds of legal fees. Now, I've been to the Balkans 12 times as a human rights activist. I'm also president now as a volunteer uh, of the Albanian American Civic League. So I saw firsthand the communism that still exists there. But I see now they're going to Albania to try to get babies. So we have many couples, perhaps a couple of million, in, in the United States that cannot have children, that want children, and we'll why are we doing a better job matching those who don't want these pregnancies with those people here? Why are they forced to go through the red type tape in Colombia or getting babies with perhaps AIDS in, in Romania? Uh, this is not right. So we need to do a better job on this. I truly believe in the sanctity of life. To me, the, the word choice is not an issue when it comes to two lives and being. I do believe and many believe that life begins in the womb. It's not upon birth. And that when a life is in the womb, it's very vulnerable. Just like life is very vulnerable when it is very old, very sick, very infirm. And that's why I would be against, obviously, euthanasia and what Dr. Kevorkian is doing. Uh, to me, the issue is to celebrate life, to work hard as one of the best civilized societies in the world, to find solutions that are mutually beneficial to the person with the unwanted pregnancy, to the child that's not yet born, and to those people who would like to have those children. So I'm working very hard on that, and certainly I would agree with parental consent and, and also waiting periods on that as well. The issue of health care. Certainly I would not vote for a health care bill that uh, used money for abortions, abortions, except for where the life of the mother was in danger. The Catholic okay. Church just recently tried to make a, an arrangement with, with the Clinton administration on that they could come out and support the health care bill if they did not have uh, federally funded abortions included in it. But the church did say that they would uh, allow or agree to and still approve the bill that the person can go out and get a rider towards it on their own and pay for it on their own. Well, I, I would that go, was not agreed by the, by the administration. Yeah, I could see that. And uh, I guess it was a good attempt to try to reach a compromise. But I still have problems with other parts That's of the bill. Hell. And maybe I could so just I. say so that. Uh, you do, you, I think we it's have important. five minutes. Take about a minute or two, because I okay. want to leave you a good three minutes to wrap up your... Uh, Very good, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, on the health care bill, when I was a partner in Arthur Anderson, uh, for five years as a tax partner, I was kind of in charge of the industry section that related to health care, the hospitals. Back in 1981, um, I proposed to one of the larger hospitals in New York to do a hospital reorganization and ended up, ending up implementing that. <clears throat> what that says is that I'm familiar with the nuts and bolts Oops. of health care. So I would be a useful voice on the inside for this district and for America. What do I see wrong with the health care system? We need portability. There's no question. If you're fired from a job, you should be able to, to take, take that you. pension with you. That's got to be uh, looked at. Affordability. Why do we have doctors with so much paperwork?
Why, mm -hmm. are, why is there so much money being spent on insurance premiums? Mm -hmm. Why is so much money being diverted from the health care, what's put into you know, administering health care to the patient? We've got to deal with this. There's too much money coming from the trial attorneys into this. We have to limit the awards for what we call uh, pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. If you're damaged, you're entitled to damages. But we've got too many of these huge awards mm -hmm. that are not easily measured we got to put some reasonable limitation on that, and that'll begin to reduce the price of health care. So we have to make it affordable. There's another thing, Kevin. If you take a poll around America, 80% of the people or more feel today that America has the best health care system in the world. Does that mean it shouldn't be improved? No. We've got to find out how to cover everybody. Mm -hmm but not by making the government in charge of everything and creating the biggest bureaucracy in the world. And what you'll have is like Canada, rationed health care, people standing online, coming to Detroit to get operations Delicious. because they can't get yeah. them there. We don't want that. So we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need to amend the, the, or reform health care. Uh, we've got to bring uh, more people into the system, ultimately, step by step, 100%. We need affordability, portability. Uh, and we need to use common sense so that the doctors are able to practice good quality medicine, mm -hmm. not defensive medicine. Okay. So we have about two minutes. Uh, I'd like you to give a wrap up uh, and, and address the voters of why they should be voting for you on primary day and then again on election day. And if you should be successful, or let's think positive, you will be successful, come on back to, to the show after September 13th so that we okay. can get more of your views. Please well, address the voters. Thank you. I guess one of the best reasons to vote for Jody Aguardi is that I was there before. I have a record. You can see the hundreds of votes, probably over a thousand votes that I cast in a period of, of four years. So when I say what I'm going to do, you can test it easily by what I've done. Number two, when it comes to taxes, I made that pledge again that I would never ever think of raising taxes because I see how badly money is abused. Your money is abused in government. In fact, of all the candidates running in the Republican and conservative primaries, I'm the only one to sign the pledge from the uh, Americans for tax reform that I will not raise taxes. So that's a, a, an important reason. Of all the candidates running, I'm the only true conservative and truly pro-life candidate in the race. And I think that's very important for the Republicans and conservatives who are going to vote on September the 13th. It's a crowded field. Uh, and, and that is, I think, a big difference between me and the others. Also, look at my business background as a certified public accountant. It is a unique background for government, having spent 22 years in a very large accounting firm, four years in Congress, and since then, five years as the chairman of a foundation, Truth in Government, unpaid, and then the president of the Albanian American Civic League, unpaid, where I was a human rights activist, trying to help oppress people in Eastern Europe. And I was an activist here, traveling around America with my book, Unaccountable Congress, It Doesn't Add Up, in order to light a fire under the people on Main Street so that they would get involved in the system to change it. I see myself, Kevin, as the Paul Revere of fiscal responsibility. I want to keep ringing that bell to wake up government and wake up the people so that they're not consistently overtaxed and their money wasted. The best way for me to do that is to get back as the congressman to replace a great, co great congressman who is now retiring, Hamilton Fish, and I look forward to being the congressman for the 19th Congressional District. Joe, thank you very much for coming on the show. As you can see, Joe has a lot of energy, a lot of views. Uh, he has been in Congress before and he's looking to get back into Congress again. Uh, we want to thank you again for watching C-Tech Cable Channel 8. We'll be airing several interviews, in fact, all the interviews with all the Republican and Democratic and conservative parties up until September 12th. So keep on watching CTEC Cable Channel 8. And again, thank you very much for watching.